Okay, so we'll, we'll start looking at the work of Cézanne. He was born in 1839, lived through till 1906, actually a little bit older than Van Gogh and, and Gauguin, a little bit closer to the generation of the Impressionists themselves. But we will think of him primarily as a post-Impressionist. Like the other two that we've looked at already, he went through Impressionism, but then in his mature style did something beyond it. Um, he retains, unlike Gauguin, he retains the naturalistic quality of Impressionism, working from nature. Of course, Van Gogh did that too. Cezanne, right to the end of his life, liked to work out in the landscape, work directly from nature, as the Impressionists mostly did. But in terms of style, he moves, moves beyond it. You know, we think of uh, Impressionism as very spontaneous, uh, approach to painting, working directly from nature rather than study in the studio, produce a work very, very slowly and methodically with pre preparatory studies and so forth. Maybe Cezanne found that Impressionism was a bit too spontaneous, a bit too informal and reacted against it. So there's a, a certain degree of control or search for order in his work search for formal organization or for compositional structure. There's a bit more of intellect in it. it there isn't the, 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 you know, so in post-impressionism is many different things in the case of different artists. You know, there isn't the search for symbolism or in the imagination as we get with Gauguin. There isn't the, so much of the expressive emotive quality that we get with Van Gogh. But what we could say all these three artists have in common is a desire to put a bit more of the artists themselves into the painting, a little less of just of the world, a bit more of subjectivity, although in Cezanne's case it's not so much the subjective emotion of the artist as we have a sense of the controlling, ordering mind of the, the artist. Whereas in another kind of, all this is oversimplification, but you know, if you say Van Gogh and Gauguin explored color, maybe you can say Cezanne explores form. And whereas Van Gogh and Gauguin influence the Fauves and Matisse, maybe uh, Cezanne influenced Picasso and the Cubists. Certainly he did, but uh, that little picture of the development of modern art is a bit oversimplified, you know, for instance, Matisse was also very interested in Cezanne's work. Cezanne's art is a little difficult to look at sometimes. It's full of dichotomies or ambivalences or, or binaries, you know. It's a strength of his art comes from this. He doesn't just go for one easy solution. There's a sort of tautness about, about his art, an exploratory quality. Uh, so for instance, he, he's interested in working from nature, just as the Impressionists were, but he's also interested in working from art. Um, you know, in, in the work of Monet, you can hardly see a reference to any earlier art. The art of the museums is almost forgotten. But with Cezanne, that's not the case. So he puts that desire to bring art and nature together into some things he says. For instance, he talks about making out of Impressionism something solid and durable, like the art of, of the museums. He likes Impressionism, but he wants something a bit more, you know, ordered. He puts the same idea another way. He says, he talks about wanting to redo Poussin from nature. Poussin is an archetypal artists of old master artists art from the Louvre, art from the museum. He likes Poussin very much, but he wants to do Poussin from nature, bring a more spontaneous touch to it. So putting two opposites together and bring them, get the best of both. Both. He likes to have the appearance of nature, all its rich surface of nature, which the Impressionists love so much, the sort of skin of nature, you could say. But he also looks for something a bit more 
durable, you know, where Monet is quite happy to paint reflections on the surface of a water, water for instance, but Cezanne, you, you'll often find him painting a mountain, something a bit more unchanging. He's interested in nature, but he's also interested in pictorial order. He's interested in giving you a sense of three-dimensional depth. He's never as flat as those paintings of Gauguin are, but at the same time, he is concerned with two-dimensional surface organization. Uh, another way to put it is to say he's interested in the romantic and the classic. Classic we associate with order, romantic with dynamism and emotion. Those two polarities are both at work in his painting. We see in his work a kind of distortion of naturalistic form. So one question that will come up is, what is, what is that for? Why is that? It could be in a kind of expressive distortion, such as we see with Van Gogh. It could be a distortion for compositional, structural purposes, or to create beautiful shapes, significant forms. Um, it could be to try and give you a sense of the time dimension in art. I'll say more about that later or just to make you aware of the language of art itself. A lot of modern art, you're aware of the means of painting. Going back to that statement of Maurice Denis, you're aware of painting as a painting first, and then you start to be aware of what it's a painting of. Now, Cezanne wrote quite a bit about his art, and it might be interesting to look a little bit at what he has to say, but I think you know, as art historians, it's our responsibility to come up with interpretations of the art. We can't ask the artist what they think it means. You know, that's, that's, there's no easy way out like that. What an artist thinks he's, his or her work is, means is another question altogether. Um, their interpretation is also uh, retrospective as much as ours. In Cezanne's case, it's particularly difficult because when he comes to when he make when he makes a painting, he's very adventurous. He's working at the cutting edge, doing something new. But when he writes about painting, that may be arguably not the case. He he comes up with some more traditional uh, ideas about what painting should be. So there's a to some extent a sort of disparity between what he says and what he does. He doesn't even himself have the language for talking about what is novel about his art. As I have done already with Van Gogh and Gauguin, I'm showing you some of his early work. And like, uh, like Van Gogh, I would say, he's an artist with not an excess of natural talent. A lot of his early works look a little bit awkward. He's sort of struggling to master the basic vocabulary of painting. But as I said with Van Gogh too, you know, it's often those artists who actually get pushed to do something important. Uh, if you have a great facility at something, maybe you, you, you don't feel you need to, to go further with it. You're happy with where you find yourself already. So looking at one of his early works, The, the Murder. Very raw, emotive quality in a lot of his early works. You could say that's the sort of the romantic side. A lot of romantic art deals with death and, and, and uh, you know, these sort of negative phenomena of human nature, the non-rational side of human nature. It's a very raw, expressive kind of art. It's almost as if it, his own personal emotions are coming out in, in his art in a relatively unmediated way, Cru a crudity about, about it all, very vehement, violent uh, emotion. Maybe you have a sense of it being the painting is more about private meanings rather than public meanings. I mean, it relates to the subject matter of, of romantic art, but romantic art usually it's a, an de la Croix, for instance, it's usually a, a, a telling of a story from literature or history. There's usually some words behind the painting, but we don't get that so much uh, uh, here in these works by Cezanne. 
here's an, a bit of evidence of his interest in romantic art. Here's a copy that he made of a famous painting by Delacroix, a small scale copy because it's, it's actually a very big painting which uh, can be seen in the Louvre. Here is the painting itself. Dante and Virgil, you know, crossing to hell. It's an illustration of, from the great Italian writer Dante. So, yeah, you can see the themes of death, that suffering coming across, religious concerns. Well, yeah, it's just a small scale, sketchy co copy. He's not attempting to, to, to produce a finished version, but it's a little bit of evidence of his interest in Delacroix's works. He owned uh, several reproductions of, printed reproductions of Delacroix's works and make copies of, of several of them, this being one. It's another work which I suppose shows him looking towards uh, uh, Delacroix. This is The Eternal Feminine, 1875 to, to 77. And I'd like to compare this compositionally to this very famous Delacroix painting, The Death of Sard and Athens. Again, it's, it's a romantic example of romantic art exploring the negative side of human nature. Sardin Aphrodis is having everyone, all his servants and concubines, slaves, put to death uh, as his own death approaches the end of his own empire. But that sort of pyramidal structure uh, is there in Cézanne's work and the figure on a bed as the center of a whole crowd of, of, of sorry, crowd, crowd of people. I think Sard the Sardanapalus paintings is one of the things that's there in the background that he's thinking of when he produces this work. Another artist uh, uh, I think he's looking at is Manet. You see that in this work, The Picnic, 1869. Again, technically uh, and motively very sort of crude kind of painting, raw quality about it. His ability to handle space is, is uh, a little bit underdeveloped at this point. You see some simple attempts to try and impose an order, you know, the angle of the tree, the angle of the figure, correct to or this figure, this tree, but um, strange subject. The subject of the picnic makes us think of Manet's very famous painting. Dejeuner sur lab, luncheon on the grass. Also, rather unusual kind of picnic scene. But here, there's hardly any food to eat. Uh, some people are wandering off already. It's really rather odd. The picnic cloth doesn't seem to sit on the ground very well. Figures seem distorted formally. So some interest in Manet, but you know, a very, very personal approach to painting. little bit more and intra, uh, evidence of his interest in Manet, a modern Olympia, 1872 to 4. So clearly it's his reinvention of a famous theme of Manet's painting, Manet's Olympia, the female nude on, on a bed and with the black uh, female servant bringing flowers. Well, Many of the same ingredients are there, the servant, the bed, the naked woman, the flowers, but the, the slightly different configuration, and instead of uh, the, the cat on the bed, we have a, a dog. And instead of the implied presence of the spectator visiting uh, this woman, we have an actual visitor, 
whose features very much resemble those of Cezanne himself. So it's, it's, it's a painting about uh, erotic themes or about the artist's own kind of involvement in his, uh, his own erotic fascinations, if you like, trying to, 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 to deal with it. So it, it's, it's very emotive still. Following an idea of the art historian Mayor Shapiro, we could say maybe you can see a development in, in his art where he tries to move a little bit away from uh, that sort of raw emotive quality of his earlier art. So the, the, the compositional order that he imposes on things is, is, is an attempt to sort of find a way back from that. It's a, a study probably in a life class, uh, he attended the Academy Swiss in Paris. That was a s simple kind of place to study. You didn't have proper instructions. You just had a life model, and this is one of the the, the, the models he, he would often paint there. Uh, what, you know, it was one of the regular models there. Again, there's this enormous distortion of the figure's form, but somehow here I feel it, it works, you know. There's a lot of paintings where it, there is distortion of form, like uh, the, the Odalisk of, Ma uh, of Arn, for instance, but uh, you don't necessarily feel it as distorted because it seems to work within the, what the painting's trying to do. There's a bit more observation here, not just working from his raw world of inner turmoil of feeling. The answer seems to be to somehow to control that, that world of in, inner turmoil by turning outwards towards reality. So, still life painting, the black clock. Turn towards the objective world seems to somehow help help him. I think there's still this interest in Mane. You know, in Mane you have lovely use of black, or like the lemon is just like a little detail you might find in a Mane still life, a beautiful Mane-esque uh, quality. Well, controlling the raw emotion, yeah, still life and working from reality helps you with that but also compositionally, the sort of structuring, the way the cloth is treated, create these sort of verticals which you know, help to provide a kind of almost grid-like structure for the painting as a whole. The folds in, in the cloth help to create a, a visual order. He's concerned with composition. Space is still a bit unclear, say around the clock. It's a little unclear, the clock without its any hands, stillness, absence of time. There's this very baroque form of the, the shell. That's the most raw thing within the world of the painting. There's a connection to Manet through a childhood friend of Cezanne's. This is Zola. A, right, a very famous naturalist, a realist writer, Zola. He um, was a friend of of, of Cezanne's and also, you know, knew, knew Manet, was painted by Manet. He's thinking very much in tonal terms here, isn't he? He's organizing things in terms of lights and darks, sharp, deep blacks and bright whites. You know, Monet said that when Cezanne worked at the Academy Swiss from a model. He put a black hat and a white handkerchief in front of it so he could sort of measure the lights and darks, thinking in terms of lights and darks. But here's a transformation in his art, and that transformation is the discovery of Impressionism. I'm, to I'm talking at the beginning about Impressionism as an art that's very spontaneous and informal and how Cezanne's uh, post-Impressionism is moved beyond that formality. But 
the funny thing is perhaps at the very beginning when he encounters Impressionism it actually represents a sort of discipline for him, a, a discipline of turning outwards to the, to the world from your inner world of feelings. That may be part of what he's sort of getting, getting from it all. Uh, I, sh I should have said before going on that actually still life uh, becomes very important for him. Landscape is very important for him, but still life is also very important for him. Uh, basically, still life would be what he would be doing on the days when it's raining, when he's st stuck in his studio, he can't go out to paint in the landscape. Uh, but it has particular uh, values, you know. For an artist who wants to try and control composition as he is in his later works, uh, still life helps you because you can rearrange the objects to make a composition that you want. You can't do that with a landscape. Of course, you can choose your how you frame a landscape for you, but it's not the same as rearranging things directly. Um, he, you can make a, you know, a still life could be very static. You can choose objects that aren't going to change. A clock without hands, for instance, is not going to change. Whereas the, the, the light and the atmosphere can change in a landscape, the foliage can change over time. You, you, so if you're an artist who likes to take their time working on things, as uh, Cezanne becomes that kind of artist, then um, yeah, still life will work well for you. And also later as he comes to be concerned with having both a three dimension sense of the third dimension but also a sense of two dimensional design the shallow space of a still life is very good for that you can shift from 2d to 3d without it seeming so disruptive so the, this is the house of the hangman over over is where um, dr gachet lived you know and and where Van Gogh lived at the very end of his life. Dr. Gachet, who was a, the doctor who was also a, uh, a, a practi practiced as an artist. So this is his, the, an example of his Impressionist phase. So we clearly see quite a difference in, in the style. Instead of those concerns, like in the black clock painting, we're thinking in a tonal way. Here, color is much more important there's much more of a broken touch, the broken, more spontaneous touch of Im Impressionism. Though he still respects contours quite a lot. Um, greater sense of, 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 of light, color in, in the, the shadows and so forth, instead of just painting shadows as black. A different palette altogether. The Impressionist he was the closest to was Pizarro, and Pizarro is the one most concerned with rural life, which is what Cezanne himself uh, takes on. Very approachable. We saw how he was a help, helpful artist for Gauguin, and he was also helpful for Cezanne. They would work side by side in 18... Um, 73 they were working side by side and again in 1877 so they, they actually the influence is probably both ways and uh, it's not just that Cezanne is learning things from Pizarro although he certainly was but it may be a little of the influence traveled the other way too so the general impression is style he could have got from Pizarro but also the in particular, the concern with r rural life, whereas Monet and Renoir and Degas were more of the painters of urban life. A certain sort of earthiness about Pizarro um, would have appealed to him. Some paintings by Pizarro, so even some sp specific things, like there are some paintings by Pizarro where he likes to paint houses viewed through the branches of trees, and you see that in some. Cezanne works. The space here is very funny, you know, you see there's a road in the foreground but it immediately splits and one part 
sort of disappears, but you can't see the road, and you see it come back again, and then just disappeared again. Some echoing of forms or to create a sort of compositional structure, perhaps. He's still already concerned with ordering. Just to give you a, a, a couple of examples of Pizarro works. This is from 1867, very early work by Pizarro, and then a work from during the time when he was already knew Cezanne. This is uh, back to sorry, back to um, to C to C Cezanne, another small impressionist painting. This is as, perhaps as close as he gets to impressionism, the the sort of spontaneous, light-filled landscape. Moving to show the first of the works I want to look at that in which we see uh, a mature style of, of, of Cezanne. We see a pattern a little bit different I suppose from Gauguin where there's so many different influences coming in. Um, the Japanese print which is so important for Gauguin and for Van Gogh doesn't really um, come up as, a, as an influence for Cezanne. The Still Life with Compotier, around 1879 to 1882. We don't know exact dates for a lot of Cezanne's paintings. He didn't date, date the works, and we don't have documentary evidence that gives us very firm dating for all of them. So um, a lot of it is just a matter of stylistic um, evaluation as to, to what the date would be. We've seen this before. We saw it... Um, copied into the background of Gauguin's, one of Gauguin's paintings. Remember, this is one of the works that Gauguin bought, owned himself. So a good example of the early uh, mature period of, of Cézanne. still retains something of the spontaneity of Impressionism. We, we, you have, you see, sense he's an artist who's still, he's still very much in love with the particularities of nature, each individual apple lovingly considered, for instance, but at the same time he wants to give you a greater sense of structure and compositional order, pictorial order, pictorial structure. And as I say, you could, following Mayor Shapiro, see this as, as partly uh, an attempt to, to kind of impose order on his own unruly inner emotional life, something like that. Here's, um, here's Cezanne. Actually, it, it's someone else writing down what Cezanne said. So it's and and, th and then it's in a English translation, which is probably probably not the most perfect one either. So it's hard to be you know we're one remove two removes from Cezanne himself, but still give you a little bit of a sense of his thinking. He says, "I am the subjective consciousness uh, of this landscape, and my canvas in its uh, is its objective consciousness. My canvas and the landscape are both outside me." but the latter is chaotic, haphazard, confused, without logical life, without any kind of rational being, whilst the former is permanent categorized and it participates in the world of ideas. He's trying to get across this idea that art and life are, are sort of different. Life just comes the way it comes, whereas in the world of a painting, you, the artist, have to be concerned for m making it rationally ordered. It's your responsibility. It has its own rules which are different from the rules of life. One, um, paintings are made, constructed things. They're not innocent mirrors of the world. There's one point where 
Suzanne is quoted as saying that you know there's a point in his career where he's trying to find he's trying to paint sunlight and he's trying to find the color on his can his palette to do so and realizing there is no color that is as bright as sunlight you know that actually reality and and our representations of it are just completely different things uh, now how, no, how, however bright a color you choose to represent a sun in a painting it's not going to be emitting photons you know if you if you look directly at the sun for more than a few seconds you could be permanently blinded you know you can't that's you're never going to have the same experience if you look at a painting of a sun it's just the two things are just completely different so you just got to realize a painting works in accordance with its own laws at some level all artists of course would know that but here is a, a sort of recognition of a certain freedom of the difference between art and life that art, life art is never the same as life and when you're making a painting you're making something artificial <coughs> He's got to relate to the world, but he's also got to relate to creating an order within the world of a painting itself. <coughs> so we can look at little details and try and say how this might work in relation to this kind of goal. So, for example, this knife here. Well, um, the part of the work the knife does is to re-establish a surface you know all this still life is arranged on the surface it looks like a box because there's a clasp like a chest there's the, the cloth flowing over the edge of the chest why is that well because otherwise this edge of the chest would be so such a strong accent it would just sort of cut the bottom of the image off visually it would be too dominant of course the chest the box has has an edge but in the world of you, the painting that you are trying to make, you can't let that edge just be there. Otherwise, it will be a really strange or boring as a painting, just one line going all the way across. So, okay, hide it, put the cloth there. That takes away the strength of that line, and it, it blurs the sense of where a, a flat plane meets a, a vertical plane that's good for you because you're trying to make a design on a 2D surface it's a flat surface you're working with but oh but maybe you've gone too far maybe uh, the danger is that then it all becomes too flat or amorphous so oh okay let's re-establish a sense of the flat surface by putting an, a knife there we re-establish re it a little bit we, we don't want it to disappear entirely so you can see how still life helps you with this kind of task where you can rearrange objects as you want them for your own purposes. Still life is uh, the world at, uh, within arm's reach, the tactile world, a world that you can touch and change and hold and rearrange. What about you know these grapes over the edge of the bowl? Why, uh, why do they happen to be escaping from the bowl? I suppose, again, you could say to stop the edge of the bowl being too strong. Visually, you could say that helps to break that accent a little bit. The bowl itself seems to be elongated, stretched. Well, that helps create a certain kind of horizontal accent. But also, you, you f as you're looking at the painting, you're sort of entering the world of the painting, almost like a potter playing with molding shapes you 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 have a sort of tactile not just a visual engagement with the world of the the painting there are different forms rhyme with other forms you know to help to create uh, you know a sense of order within the painting form of the water in the wine glass or maybe it's wine anyway the top of that liquid in the, the wine glass rhymes also with the forms of the leaves on the wallpaper behind 
we have diff we we seem to be looking at things from different angles. You know, the we're looking down on the the surface of the table. It's sort of flattened flattened out or raised up would be another way to put it. We're looking at a different angle on the surface of the water from the s the, 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 the rim of the, the wine glass. If that's what the rim looked like, is that how the surface of the water should look like? Maybe not. Maybe it should be a shallower angle or something. But it creates the kind of forms that work with other forms in, in the painting, perhaps. Maybe you can understand it that way. There's another kind of ordering going on, and that's at the level of the brush stroke, sort of building up the painting to a sort of kind of woven or knitted patchwork of brush strokes, the same kind of diagonal stroke over the whole of the painting, little patches, building it up. It's almost like using a sort of building block structure. So even at that at that level, the, sorry, at that level, the painting is brought together into a, a unity. These are all just my suggestions, a sort of a suggested reconstruction of how uh, Cezanne might have been thinking about how he's dealing with this task of how to, how to organize the painting as a whole. I can't guarantee to you that this is how he thought, but. Uh, it's just I think it's something along this this line. Um, it's a, it's a very considered image, a thought out image. The world doesn't tell you how to represent it. You know, as an artist, you can you're always having to make decisions. Different. Different viewpoints on the, the, as I say, on the, the surface of the, 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 you know, the rim of the wine glass and the surface of the water, or the, the, the different angle on the, that we're looking, side on at the fruit bowl, but not at the surface on which it is, standing, but you know, th this is actually close to how we we look at reality we're adding information from different viewpoints are even if our head is not moving around our eyes are moving around gathering um, gathering information from different viewpoints so if a painter shows everything in perfect perspectival illusion that's not the truth of how they're actually looking when they're making a painting that's a sort of that truthful perfect image is a sort of lie actually and maybe a Cezannean image is a more truthful image, an image that says, well, actually, I, I was looking at a slightly different viewpoint here from here, but in the painting, I had to put them all together. You're adding together different viewpoints. Even if you're looking at something so close to you, a still life just in front of you, you're still adding together information. But if I had to paint, make a painting of this room, I'd be looking down here, I'd be looking over there, looking over there. Uh, what am I going to do? Paint a perspectival one-point perspective image as if I was looking, standing at one unified viewpoint. Well, I have two eyes as well. That's another thing that adds together information from more than one viewpoint. If you if you're a painter, you will know you will know that you're what you have two eyes. Maybe most of the time, most of us are not aware of this. But you try drawing from a model, you start to be aware which eye is your dominant eye, which eye you're looking through, things like that. You start, these things start to become, the physiology of vision starts to Im intrude into the process. Well, let's look at the mature work from the point of view of uh, a landscape. The Bay from Lestat, 1886. So this is uh, Provence. This is the part of France that Cézanne was from. He went to Paris and encountered Impressionism and went through many of his sort of breakthrough 
moments there. He needed the museums of Paris apart from anything else, apart from the modern art world. But he goes back to the south of France. It's the same pattern we see here with, with Van Gogh and Gauguin, going to Paris but then going away from Paris. Both are important phases for their, for their life. But for Cézanne, it's a kind of going back home. So where his family was from, where he grew up, a landscape that he's very familiar with, not an exotic uh, uh, environment like Tahiti would have been for, for Gauguin. So this is uh, Lestac, the, the coast of Provence, looking over towards where Marseille is, the big city of Marseille. You can see the same concern for ordering, like the way the, the smoke from the chimney happens to be blowing over this way in the same direction as the pier, which happens to be coming out this way. They're sort of signaling across to each other. He's picking up uh, the boundaries of objects. We're very aware of the block-like 3D forms of the, the building. It's not pure nature that interests him. It's, na it's nature with man's structures within it. You know, man-made structures. Mm. You know, it, it help just as a painting is a man-made thing. So the man-made structures he help you to provide structuring accents within the painting. Factory chimneys. whereas the Impressionists were concerned to almost dissolve everything into a, a veil of light and, light and color. Cezanne has almost gone the, the opposite way. You know, sometimes it, it, in a Monet painting, nothing seems solid at all. And the archetypal subject in Monet's painting is the surface of water. Yet for Cezanne, the surface of water almost seems solid. It's another solid thing. You could almost imagine walking across the, the surface of it, solid as the mountains. It's a reversal of, the, of, of impression. <laughs> this is... Um, this is Cezanne writing to uh, his friend Pizarro, the Impressionist painting, about working down in the south of France in Provence. He says, it's like a, here it's like a playing card, red roofs against the blue sky. If the weather is favorable, I shall perhaps carry them, there's a series of pictures he's making for his patron Choquet, through to the end. Up to the present, I've done nothing. Motis can be found here which would require three or four months work and that is possible because the vegetation doesn't change. A lot of the uh, vegetation there is, is sort of um, um, not seasonally changing so uh, yeah that, that helps him with working over long periods of time as he increasingly comes to do. With a still life of course that's easy but with a you can just leave it for, for ages, but with a, a landscape then it's not always possible. Remember the Impressionists are concerned exactly with fugitive effects, changing light effects, momentary effects, but he's looking for something a bit more unchanging and, and, and fundamental in the landscape. Uh, he says the landscape is composed of olive and pine trees which always preserve their foliage. The sun is so terrific that it seems to me as if the objects were silhouetted not only in black and white, but in blue, red, brown, and violet. I may be mistaken, but this seems to me the opposite of modeling, a sort of flattening out of the landscape in the intense light and color. Just show you one more. Uh, Zola's house at Medon. This is, um, you know, Zola, the famous writer who was his friend. Again, strong sense of 
concern with ordering all the verticals and horizontals. He's picked out the forms of the trees, uh, the river bank, and even the reflections become strong vertical accents. Very grid-like structure. Again, making use of man-made structures to help create that. And it's also the, the flattening front-on viewpoint that he's taken that enables that grid, getting rid of any diagonals that would otherwise be present that create a sense of, of illusionistic depth. And as with the earlier work, knitting everything together at the level of brushwork, little patches, not individual touches the way the Impressionists did, but little kind of patches of, 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 of paint, almost a ta tapestry-like effect. Good. So we'll carry on next week, look at the later work of, of, of Cezanne. If we have time, we might start to say a little bit about Seurat, the last of the great post-impressionist generations of artists that we want to look at.